Good morning. Happy Public Lands Week. Thank you all for joining us today. I'm Ada Culver, the Deputy Director for Policy and Programs for the Bureau of Land Management. It's my honor and privilege to serve as your host for today's symposium. And I'm speaking to you today from the ancestral homelands of the Cheyenne and Ute people. I wanna begin by thanking the Public Lands Foundation, the Conservation Lands Foundation, and the University of California Berkeley's Institute for Parks, People, and Biodiversity for hosting this virtual symposium. And also wanted to give a shout out to our special assistant, Alex Diera, and our crack comms and public affairs team who've been working tirelessly to bring this symposium together. In the next few hours, you hear from some really distinguished and experienced, experienced leaders and thinkers talking about the past, present, and future of America's public lands. This week is, of course, Public Lands Week, a celebration of one of the best aspects of our nation. America's vast public lands are everyone's birthright, and there are hundreds of events taking place nationwide in the next few days to help people discover and explore these treasured landscapes. This year also marks the 75th anniversary of the Bureau of Land Management, our nation's premier land management agency, if I may say so. We are the stewards of about 245 million acres of public lands, most of which are located across the West and Alaska. These lands encompass incredible natural wonders and countless recreational opportunities open to everyone. They are the engine that powers our nation's economy and support hundreds of thousands of jobs and communities across the West. The BLM does not take our responsibility to protect and manage these lands for current and future generations lightly. And I also wanted to highlight all the hard work that so many of our employees do to fulfill this responsibility. This year, as we look back on 75 years, we're also looking to the future and the kind of organization that will be needed to meet the challenges of the next 75 years and beyond. That's why we're hosting this symposium and discussions like it in the months to come. Before we start our panel discussions, I want to introduce a few speakers for some brief remarks. We're so honored today to have the Secretary of the Interior, Deb Holland, with us live today. Secretary Holland has been and continues to be the strongest advocate we could have for public lands. She understands the importance of these lands to the health, well-being, history, and culture of our nation. As a native of the West and our country's first Native American Interior Secretary, she has a deep personal connection to these landscapes, as you'll hear. I'd now like to ask Secretary Holland to say a few words. Madam Secretary, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Nada, and good morning, everyone. I am joining you today from the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Anacostan and Piscataway people here in Washington, DC, and wishing you a happy Public Lands Week. I'm proud to note that this year, we also celebrate the 75th anniversary of the Bureau of Land Management, one of our premier teams that manages our public lands, not only for today, but for future generations. I want to say a special thanks to the Public Lands Foundation, the Conservation Lands Foundation, and the University of California Berkeley's Institute for Parks, People, and Biodiversity for hosting this virtual symposium. To all of the panelists participating today, thank you for generously giving of your time to share your insights and expertise as we reflect on the BLM's history and look forward to the challenges and opportunities for the next 75 years. I know many of you have devoted significant parts of your careers to public service, and I deeply appreciate each and every one of you for the work you have done for the American people and the work you'll continue to do. Today, the BLM manages one in 10 acres of land in the United States and nearly 40% of our nation's mineral resources. These lands, approximately 245 million acres, located mostly in the West and Alaska, are part of our heritage as Americans. They represent the largest network of public lands in the world. Over the past 75 years, the agency has become a model for sustainable management of multiple uses across our public lands. We have a shared challenge to continue that legacy even as our public lands and our outdoor heritage face great threats from climate change and increasing development. I know you all know this already, but our public lands are absolutely incredible. They provide unmatched experiences to get outside and experience the wonders of nature. Some of my best adventures have been 
on BLM lands, including a camping trip in Bears Ears a few years ago. They also tell the story of America. These public lands contain thousands of cultural and historic sites, including places that are sacred to Indian tribes. And it's not hyperbole to say that public lands help drive our economy. They support a growing outdoor recreation sector, they help power our nation, and they provide the foundation for healthy natural systems that are the backbone of our economy. It's a privilege and an honor to be able to manage these lands for the benefit of current and future generations. President Biden has been clear that this administration will help address intersecting crises to tackle climate change, advance environmental justice, and build back better. I know that the BLM will play a pivotal role in advancing that vision. The Bureau already full speed ahead in ensuring that public lands are part of the climate solution by advancing wind, solar, and geothermal projects. Where appropriate, these clean energy projects can help create good paying jobs and boost local economies. When it comes to conservation of important natural and cultural resources, from migration corridors to sacred sites, the BLM is poised to do the collaborative planning with states, tribes, and communities to deliver creative and durable solutions. And when the president talks about capping orphan wells and reclaiming hard rock mines, or making historic investments in restoring lands and waters by standing up a civilian climate corps, it is the BLM that will help create those jobs and make that vision a reality. How a nation chooses to manage its public lands says much about its priorities. I am proud to be a part of an amazing team that is committed to ensuring the sustainable use and enjoyment of these lands for the benefit of all people, no matter what your background or where you come from. I am proud to be a part of a team that is guided by science. I'm proud to be a part of a team that honors tribal sovereignty and self-governance. And I am proud to be a part of a team that is rising to meet the pressing challenges of our time. Climate change is forcing us to recognize we can't do business as usual. So as we look with pride at the past, it's incumbent on us to look forward as well, to reimagine our public lands for the next 75 years and beyond. That's why this symposium and all of the discussions we're having this year to commemorate the BLM's 75th anniversary are so important. Before I turn the agenda back over, I want to also acknowledge the recent announcement about BLM's next steps, including its headquarters. We cannot deliver on big ideas when our team is struggling from the disruptions of the past few years. The relocation of the BLM headquarters scattered employees and programs across the West, drove others out of the agency and put enormous stress on those who remained. From those of us who care deeply about this bureau, I know it's been difficult. The decision to restore the BLM headquarters to Washington DC and to create a Western, a new Western headquarters in Grand Junction with an expanded team was arrived at by many, after having had many discussions with all stakeholders. My primary concern is, and always has been for the well-being of the staff and to identify ways to restore the effectiveness of the Bureau's operations. I believe this move, along with important other steps we hope to take in coordination with leaders in Congress, will ensure the BLM is prepared to better serve communities and the economy. There are still so many details to work out with partners in our team, but I want you to know that I will always center the voices of BLM employees in the decisions that we make. For so many people, BLM lands are their backyards. The BLM employee is the neighbor, the kid's soccer coach, or the person they see at church. The BLM is a thread that is interwoven through so many communities, and that is one of the reasons I know we are also committed to the Bureau's employees, its mission, and its success. But we can't do it without you. We are eager to hear from the experts who will participate in today's discussions to get their ideas and perspectives 
on how the BLM can and should manage public lands in the 21st century. I appreciate you all. And uh, now I'll turn it back over to the moderator to continue with today's program. Thank you so much again. Hi there. Good morning, everyone. I think I, I had Nita a little bit muted on 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 my side, uh, so uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna bring her back um, and um, you know appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, appreciate Secretary Holland um, being with um, all of us here this morning, and I'm really pleased um, to be with everybody um, today to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the Bureau of Land Management and its public lands legacy. Uh, I'm Laura Daniel Davis. I'm the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Land and Minerals Management here at Interior. Um, and the other thing, well, a couple of, uh, they had a lot to say, but I do wish we were in person. I want to say that. Um, I, I feel like I'm, I'm probably speaking for everybody um, on the screen with us. Um, I too am, am joining you today from the traditional and ancestral and homelands of the Anacostan and Piscataway people. And I wanna um, second, or maybe it, it's third, the thanks to our partners um, for hosting today and giving us all the opportunity to have these really important conversations. Um, it's a really exciting time at Interior, um, and I've been honored to be able to work closely with Meta and everybody at the BLM in building on your rich history and moving forward and transforming how we manage our shared public lands heritage. Um, as Secretary uh, Holland noted, we can't continue to do business the way we have um, for the past 75 years if we really hope to meet the challenges of the 21st century. Um, we've gotta be sure that we're prioritizing and engaging in meaningful tribal consultation in our work, uh, as well as with engaging uh, with communities that have borne the impacts of uh, fossil fuel development. Um, and I feel like you, uh, all of you um, that are uh, part of BLM know and see, um, you know, as much as anyone or really more than anyone that first and foremost among our challenges is climate change. Uh, the Bureau of Land Management has a substantial role to play in reducing the climate threat on public lands in the United States. Um, and in order to tackle the climate crisis and strengthen our nation's economy, we really must, as the Secretary said, manage our, um, you probably heard her say this before, although I don't think she said it this morning, you know, manage our lands and water uh, and resources, not just across fiscal years, but across generations. Um, and that's a big part of the BLM's charge. As the nation's largest um, land management agency, BLM has an outsized role in the conservation of native species and habitats. Uh, the agency, a uh, few numbers here, manages 28 national monuments, 17 national conservation areas, and 12.6 million wilderness acres. Um, BLM uh, manages over two thirds of federal wilderness acres designated by Congress uh, across three types of habitats, rangelands, forests, and wetlands. And these core wildlife habitats are uniquely vulnerable. Um, and I know you're seeing this to the effects of climate change. We're seeing uh, it that our, our droughts are intensified, uh, our wildfires are intensified, and we're seeing greater spread and quicker spread of invasive species uh, across the landscape. So addressing these threats requires us to improve the resiliency of the lands in our care, and it requires us, uh, really importantly, to work with partners at a landscape scale across state, 
and land uh, designation boundaries, because uh, we all know uh, that, that, that species and lands uh, don't care about those boundaries. And the BLM has such an important role to play in this effort. Um, you know, we, we're seeing results uh, in our ongoing work uh, across the 12 states to conserve and protect habitat uh, for the greater sagegrass, to use sort of one of the, the larger uh, partnership examples of, of recent years. And we need to build and strengthen partnerships just like this to achieve shared outcomes that benefit both people and wildlife. Um, the BLM also uh, has an enormous role in the transition to a clean energy future and has been working on this uh, for a number of years. Um, you know, renewable energy, clean energy is going to help communities across the country be part, part of the climate solution while creating good paying union jobs. Um, our public lands, as I, I know you all know, encompass vast uh, renewable energy resources, whether we're talking about wind or solar or geothermal. And while BLM managed lands uh, will continue to be producing conventional energy for the foreseeable future, it's renewable energy that is the key to diversifying our national energy portfolio, while at the same time combating climate change and investing in communities across the West. Um, so we've got 120 uh, BLM approved clean energy projects on public lands. This is a combined total of over 12,000 uh, megawatts, and that's enough to power approximately 9 million homes. So again, BLM has been active for a while, it is sort of on the way to meeting this, this challenge. Uh, and uh, right now, um, to prove this point, you know, the agency is tracking a combined total of about 43 projects. That would be 23 solar, 4 wind, 5 geothermal, uh, 6 genti, 5 transmission lines. Um, so as always, a lot going on out there on the ground. And this would bring forward a total uh, of over 17,000 megawatts if all of these, um, all of these projects get permitted. Um, now that said, that, that sounds big and it is big and it's gonna take a lot of work and a lot of partnership. You know, more work needs to be done um, to realize the, the 25,000 megawatts uh, goal uh, by 25, 2025, which was, um, you know, Congress called for in last year's Energy Act. So the other thing I wanna talk about for a minute is we really need to do a better job. And um, I, I know everybody does work on this, but of connecting Americans with their public lands and helping them understand they've got a personal stake. Um, and America's really rapidly urbanizing. Um, we saw that in the census by 2050, it's estimated that eight in 10 of us will live in an urban or suburban area. And what that means is we do, we risk losing our connection to, to nature. Um, and that is part of our, you know, important heritage as Americans. We know um, that nature is essential to the health, well-being, and prosperity of every family and every community in America. So we need to improve access across our public lands and be sure we're welcoming an increasingly diverse America. We need to plan for increased visitation, um, improving and strengthening uh, infrastructure and facilities, um, the Great American Outdoors Act, which I'm uh, confident that everyone on this screen worked hard on to make happen, represents a really significant step. Uh, it's going to enable uh, the Bureau of Land Management and other land management agencies to uh, improve at scale um, infrastructure and reduce maintenance backlogs and to add conservation lands that enhance wildlife corridors and habitat and increase recreation access. Um, the President's America the Beautiful initiative, um, it's just a, we're, it will, it's basically kicking off a, a decade long nationwide effort to conserve, connect and restore lands uh, across the country and waters and uh, support wildlife on which we all depend. And it's really the, the cornerstone of our efforts in terms of how we, we think about, um, you know, enhancing access and, and being sure we're taking the conservation and restoration activities on the lands that need to happen. Uh, we'll be using science as our guide uh, and the, the BLM's very time-honored uh, collaborative approach um, to join forces with public and private landowners to conserve and restore at least 30% of America's lands and waters by 2030. Um, and our focus really um, is on fostering and supporting locally driven voluntary conservation efforts that work across state, federal, and tribal lands to protect and connect contiguous blocks of habitat. Because again, we know that, that wildlife uh, doesn't um, really care about our boundaries um, that, that are, that are human-made. 
working together in this way and by honoring the work that so many have done and are doing every single day across communities to steward the land uh, for the next generations, we can ensure um, that we have fresh air, we have clean water, we have uh, healthy and dependable economies and a, a livable planet <laughs> for all of us, for our kids and our grandkids. Um, we really do have enormous challenges in front of us and I'm really eager uh, to hear from our amazing group of panelists today and thank you all so much for agreeing to take time and, and talk about these issues. Um, and of course, we, we always uh, want to hear from uh, you know the American people and all of this work that we're doing um, where you know, we are all going to need to kind of grapple together um, to, to as to how we meet these challenges in the most effective way together. Um, and again, so Secretary Sol uh, Holland said that. We're all in this together. Um, we all have a stake in the future of our public lands and it's up to us um, to come together and find that path forward. So I just wanna thank everyone again uh, for joining us. I, I hope that you'll be really inspired by today's symposium. I, um, I expect to be and um, reminder, not that you need it. Um, we hope you're able to get out this weekend um, on your public lands, your public lands of choice, um, so many options and celebrate and enjoy our, our amazing and shared um, American heritage. Um, so finally, I wanna thank Maida Culver so much for her, her leadership and, and commitment. And I'm gonna turn it back over to her to continue with today's program. Thanks, Laura. And um, yes, I can be muted for those who didn't think that was possible that I could stop talking, but here we are. So sorry, Laura, as you all probably gathered, my remarks were about the amazing knowledge and experience Laura brings to this job, um, including having served um, as chief of staff to both Interior Secretary Sally Jewell and Ken Salazar in the Obama administration and bringing her two decades of experience and knowledge um, in the public and nonprofit sectors advocating for wildlife and public lands to all of us today. So thank you so much, Laura, for your inspiring words. And it's now my honor to introduce Holly Jeremis from the University of California at Berkeley. Holly is the James M. Howe, H. House and Hiram H. Hurd Professor of Environmental Regulation at Berkeley. She's also co-director of the Law of the Sea Institute and co-faculty director of the UC Berkeley Institute for Parks, People and Biodiversity, one of our main sponsors today. Holly is one of the nation's leading scholars and teachers in the areas of environmental law, natural resources law, and law and science. She has also served as a principal investigator for federal research and training grants related to natural resource issues in California, co-authored papers with economists and ecologists, and has been a member of two National Research Council review committees. We're really honored to have her with us today, representing one of our nation's finest research institutions and as a long-standing advocate for public lands policy and management. Holly, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nada. Um, I, I am, as Nada said, Holly Doremus, and I'm speaking from the ancestral and unceded lands of the Chochenyo-speaking Ohlone people. Um, I'm here in my role as the co-faculty director of the Institute for Parks, People, and Biodiversity here at UC Berkeley. And as others have said, we wish you could, we could be welcoming you in person, but we're very happy to welcome you virtually as a second best. And I'd like to offer my greetings on behalf of um, Steve Beisinger, the other faculty co-director of our institute, and John Jarvis, who was our founding executive director and is now the um, director of our uh, advisory board. The Institute for Parks, People, and Biodiversity at UC Berkeley was founded as an outgrowth of a celebration that we organized of the 100th anniversary of the National Park Service. But its um, focus is much broader than that. We are concerned with all public lands and uh, waters, that is all uh, publicly owned land and water resources across the globe. We're interested in their connections to people, as um, uh, Laura mentioned, connections between people and nature are increasingly critical in our uh, anthro severely uh, anthropogenic world. Um, 
we're interested in the management and protection of the biotic resources of these lands, parks, people, biodiversity. That's uh, our focus. And we're particularly interested in, and we believe we have expertise to bring to the questions of how science, both natural and social, uh, contributes to the management of these areas and also on the training of a new generation of managers sensitive to all the values of these lands and waters and to all the needs and, and preferences of, the, of all the people that these lands and waters do and can serve. We're very pleased to be co-hosting this symposium and very grateful to the Public Lands Foundation and the Bureau of Land Management for organizing this event and for um, allowing us to be part of it. The Bureau of Land Management, as described by uh, James Skillen in his history of it, is the nation's largest landlord. And as we've already heard from our other speakers, uh, it manages currently some 245 million acres, almost entirely um, in the west, uh, west of the Mississippi and in Alaska. And it considers itself, as we've heard, the nation's premier land management agency. And of course, it has good reason for that, um, that view. But at the same time, the Bureau of Land Management is surely the least known of the public of the U.S. public land management agencies. It is in its current form the youngest of those agencies, considerably younger than the National Park Service and the U.S. Forest Service, and even a bit younger than the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And if you say the initials BLM to some person on the streets of Berkeley these days, they will not think that you are talking about federal lands. Uh, they will think something else entirely. They will think Black Lives Matter. Uh, but the BLM, perhaps one reason that it's the least known of the public land management agencies is that it's not historically had a clear uh, identity, nor have its lands. It manages what have been called the leftover lands, the lands that were not given away in the great barbecue of the late 19th and early 20th century, and that were not withdrawn for specific purposes as national parks or as uh, national forests. It manages multiple use lands, like the Forest Service, it manages a, a great variety of lands. It has wilderness areas, it has national monuments, it has rangelands. Um, it has a current focus, as we've heard, on producing energy for the nation's needs. Also provides recreation for a large number of people, manages uh, mineral resources, manages important uh, biotic uh, resources. But again, these are the leftover lands until 1976, until the passage of the uh, FLIPMA, um, the Federal Lands Protection and Management Act, it was widely believed that these lands would eventually be disposed of or withdrawn for specific uses. Many of them, it was thought, would, would go into private and state hands. And there is still today periodic pressure to dispose of uh, federal lands, and in particular, um, the BLM's uh, lands. This 75th anniversary of the, the BLM's uh, founding in its current form is an opportunity both to celebrate its past and present and to reflect on the lessons learned and how those lessons can be applied to the agency's future. Key questions that are not going away and that hopefully we'll hear something about today, but certainly that the agency will have to keep in mind in the future. Start with the question of what lands should the United States retain at this point? Should it retain all the lands it currently has? Uh, if not, which of those uh, lands? 
Um, another key question, given the, the need for coordinated large scale landscape management these days, do we need so many different land management agencies? Does that make coordination difficult? Are there ways to structure those agencies that make coordination uh, easier? Does the Bureau of Land Management of the future need a specific identity? And if so, what is that identity? And that folds in the question of who precisely are the Bureau of Land Management's constituents? Who are the people for whom it is working? And that, of course, is a question that has always been there, always faced each of the uh, federal land management agencies since their founding, but one that perhaps faces the Bureau of Land Management most directly and most sharply uh, of all those agencies uh, today. And the, the recent decisions about headquarters are an example of that. Where the agency's headquarters are located is a statement about who the agency believes it is serving, who it needs to be close enough to talk with easily, who it needs to be in constant communication with, who it can be in less constant communication with, um, what exactly it thinks uh, is its role. And the Bureau of Land Management, obviously its headquarters is going to be back in Washington, DC. That's a statement from the current administration about who they believe their constituency is. Uh, but beyond that, they need to think about how it should be managed, how centralized or decentralized, what that looks like, how it intersects with uh, other um, federal agencies, with the states, with private entities, with tribes, with um, non-governmental organizations, et cetera. There's an awful lot to think about. I look forward to hearing what our expert panelists will say. And again, from the Institute for Parks, People, and Biodiversity at Berkeley, welcome. Thank you for being here. And thank you to all of the organizers. Thanks so much, Holly. Uh, we're now going to move to the first of our panels, focusing on the vital and challenging issues of tribal leadership and co-management of our public lands. I want to start by introducing our panel moderator and my friend and colleague, Dana Jackson. Dana is a counselor to the director of the BLM, and she and I work together daily, so I know her commitment and her talent for solving complex problems, um, and that makes her a great moderator for this panel. She spent her entire legal career in the area of natural resources and Indian law. Before coming to BLM in January, Dana was chief legal counsel to the state of Montana's Department of Natural Resources and Conservation, the agency that manages Montana's trust lands, waters, state forests, and conservation initiatives. She spent the majority of her career in the public sector, including as a federal prosecutor and health staffer. And like so many us of us who live out west, her connection to our public lands is deeply personal. Dana grew up on a cattle ranch on the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes of the Flathead Indian Reservation in beautiful Western Montana. Dana, thanks so much for leading this distinguished panel. We're all looking forward to this conversation. I'll let you take it from here. Hello, thank you. I really appreciate that, Nada. And thank you all for joining us today. I'm excited to talk with our distinguished panel about the critical issues of tribal co-management and how the BLM and other federal agencies can do better, um, be better partners to the people and governments who originally managed the land. I did grow up um, on the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes uh, Indian Reservation, and I come from a long line of uh, land managers. To, to that end, I also would like to acknowledge that I currently live in Washington, D.C., which sits on the ancestral lands of the Anacostans and neighbors the ancestral lands of the Piscataway. As Secretary um, Holland noted, these lands encompass, all, the BLM lands, encompass the ancestral homelands of hundreds of tribes and contain historic and cultural sites of enormous importance to tribal members. We um, have an interesting past and we cannot change it, but we can and must do far better in engaging tribes and working collaboratively with them to ensure that these lands are managed in ways that respect uh, their heritage, honor their ancestral 
ties. I'm joined today by some of the nation's leading experts in tribal law, natural resources, and the intersection of the two. Um, let me take a a couple minutes to introduce them to you. First, I wanna recognize Monty Mills, who has been my friend and colleague for many years. Monty is professor of law and co-director of the Marjorie Hunter Brown Indian Law Clinic at the Alexander Blewett III School of Law at the University of Montana, my alma mater, go Grizz. His research and writing focuses on the intersection of federal Indian law, tribal sovereignty, natural resources, as well as race and racism in the law and legal education. He's one of the nation's most original and compelling thinkers in this growing field, and we are honored to have him with us today. Um, next, we have Charles Wilkinson, Moses Lasky, Professor of Law Emeritus at the University of Colorado. Who doesn't know this person um, in this crowd? Um, Professor Wilkinson has literally um, uh, written the book on Indian law, or at least the founding texts. His 14 books include standard law case books on Indian law and federal um, public land law, as well as popular examinations of the history and politics of the West including Crossing the Next Meridian, Land, Water, and the Future of the West. That was one of a handful of books that both my husband and I had and when we got married and when we merged our libraries. <laughs> Over the years, um, Professor Wilkinson has also taken on special assignments for the, for the U.S. Department of of Interior Ag and Justice, including playing a very critical role as counsel and special advisor when um, the creation of the Bears Ears and Grand Staircase Escalante National Monuments was um, in the works. He's a tireless advocate and we're so delighted for you to be here today. Uh, we're also joined by Chairman Lopez of the Ama Mutsen Tribal Band in California. And Mr. Chairman has served as the chair since 2003, as well as Native American advisor to the University of California, Office of the President on issues related to repatriation. He's also a Native American advisor to the National Alliance on Mental Illness and the Phoebe Hearst Museum of Anthropology, national leader in efforts to um, restore tribal indigenous knowledge and um, ensure tribal history is accurately told. Thank you um, for joining us, Mr. Chairman. And last but not least is um, um, Cameron Martinez, mm -hmm. Sr., Director of the Division of Natural Resources for the Taos Pueblo in New Mexico. Uh, Cameron is an experienced natural resource professional having served 30 years in our sister bureau, the BIA, as a forester, silviculturist and executive, including over a decade as superintendent of the Northern Pueblos Agency. He then worked on the uh, corporation side of the Poyaki Pueblo before coming to the Taos Pueblo to oversee six departments in the Pueblos Natural Resource Program and represent the Pueblo and its leadership in interagency conservation and land management issues and initiatives. Um, we are really, he's been, long been involved in landscape level multi-agency conservation issues within the Enchanted Circle as a member of the Northern New Mexico Resource Advisory Council, the Miranda Canyon Commission, and multiple other interagencies and teams involving the BLM, Forest Service, and other state, federal, and tribal agencies. Um, I'm excited to hear his perspective today as well. I'd now like to invite each of our panelists to say a few words beginning our discussion and then we'll go from there. And we're gonna go ahead and have Professor Mills go ahead and kick us off. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. And thanks to all the organizers and Secretary Holland for joining us this morning. It's a privilege and an honor, not just to be among such distinguished and esteemed fellow panelists and moderators, um, but also in front of all of you, albeit virtually here from my office in Missoula, Montana. Uh, as others have acknowledged, I'm coming to you from the unceded, unceded lands of the Salish people here near the confluence of the Bitterroot and Clark Fork branch of the Columbia. Uh, other tribal nations have long histories in this particular area. And I'm also not too far from our public lands, although most of the lands near me or nearest to me are managed by sister agency, the Forest Service, and uh, got to go a little bit farther to get onto BLM lands from here in Missoula. But it's a real treat to be joining you. 
Uh, I have the honor of, of setting the stage here and going first uh, with this distinguished panel, and I uh, hope to just uh, accomplish some modest goals as we enter this discussion and leave plenty of time uh, to engage in discussion with the panel. I, as others have already acknowledged, I think we have to begin with some of the history of the public lands estate, particularly lands managed by the BLM, in order to really think clearly about and understand uh, the potential future of tribal leadership around the management of public lands. Uh, but I also want to talk about some of the current legal frameworks, issues, and challenges that are presented by um, the, the laws and policies and regulations um, that all of you on the call, I'm sure, know quite well in your day-to-day -day work, and maybe open up some opportunities to think about ways in which we can move forward um, toward broader tribal leadership in this particular area. So as Secretary Holland mentioned already, um, I think it's apt to suggest that the public lands really do tell the story of America. And both in the context of uh, our history as expansion, but also particularly in the context of legal frameworks applicable to thinking about tribal co-management and the role of tribes in public land management. As uh, Professor Doremus mentioned, the, the great barbecue and the disposition of the public estate really was premised and rooted on rooted in the removal and exclusion of indigenous peoples from lands on which they had enjoyed connections and management and, and deep, deep knowledge of since time immemorial. And the acquisition by the federal government and ultimate disposition of that public estate really was premised on the notion that uh, indigenous people could be and were erased either from consideration across those lands. That process or those federal policies toward removal and isolation of indigenous people and the acquisition of the public lands that indigenous people once inhabited and continue to maintain connections to resulted in the growth of two oftentimes separate and distinct areas of the law. On the one hand, principles of federal Indian law and time honored and recognized doctrines from the United States Supreme Court arose from challenges faced by tribes from states and from removal by the federal government. Those doctrines rooted in the treaty relationships between the United States and tribal governments remain important and foundational notions for the federal tribal relationship to this day. The use of treaties, for example, as the supreme law of the land under our constitution, continue to ensure and protect reserved rights by tribes across public lands and elsewhere, particularly here in the West, but really across the nation. And through those legal doctrines protecting those rights, tribes and tribal members continue to access public lands for various lifeways and activities. Similarly, the federal government's trust relationship grew out of those legal challenges and tribal efforts to protect and preserve their own sovereignty from assault by this historical oppression and expansion, the colonial project as it were. And both of those areas are remain core to the federal government's responsibilities to tribes. But a separate framework, a separate series of laws and policies also grew up out of that history. And that really has resulted in the modern set of public land laws and management regulations that we know today. And unfortunately, for much of the history of those two areas of the law, they've been treated as distinct and, and not overlapping and not a lot of connection between the two. In fact, as was noted in, by the Public Land Law Commission about 50 years ago, Right around the same time, interestingly, that the federal Indian policy was shifting toward tribal self-determination, tribal lands were entirely excluded and tribal connections to public lands were entirely excluded from the influential work of that commission. Work that ultimately resulted in FLIPMA and other influential public land management policies. And so it's within that history and that legal framework that we have to be able to approach thinking about current opportunities and potentially the future expansion of tribal reconnections, or at least the re-recognition of tribal prerogatives, tribal priorities, tribal interests in our nation's public lands. Because importantly, despite that long history of removal and exclusion and erasure from the laws and policies and the lands themselves, tribes retain and remain deeply connected across the public lands that form their homelands. We particularly recently, I mentioned the, the growth of the Tribal Self-Determination Act 
and the tribal self-determination policy, the expansion of tribal sovereignty led by tribal leaders. And over the last generations, we've begun to see the work of tribes and tribal leaders begin to reestablish those connections in important ways. Certainly, as I mentioned, the use and reliance of treaty rights and their important legal stature through the fish wars, particularly of the middle 20th century, the 1950s and 60s, has resulted in a long-standing co-management of those shared resources across the Pacific Northwest and in the Great Lakes region. Tribes, states, federal agencies working together to help manage those resources for the benefit of all, both in those regions and across the country. More recently, of course, we've seen efforts on the part particularly of executives to direct agencies like the BLM and all agencies across interior and elsewhere to more substantively, more fruitfully, and more responsibly engage in tribal consultation. Beginning with executive orders, particularly through the mid-1990s, most every presidential administration at some, in some form has committed to re-engaging and improving the way in which tribal input is received and reflected in federal decision-making. And of course, with the enactment of the, the Indian Self-Determination Education Assistance Act in the mid-1970s, and importantly, further amendments to that act to make it more effective, tribes have engaged in a broad-based reassumption of previously federal program services, functions, and activities that have served to build tribal capacity, build tribal governance, and really restore tribal control over what activities that are happening within the reservation. We can't ignore also the growth of tribal political power and the expertise and, and ability that tribes have begun to wield within the powers of Congress or the halls of Congress and important legislative enactments like NAGPRA have begun to shift the way in which the federal government operates around particular aspects of management and resources across the country. And nonetheless, despite all of that progress and beginning to make those reconnections, there still remains more to do. And certainly recent efforts, as uh, Dana mentioned, Professor Wilkinson's leadership and uh, the leadership of the Intertribal Coalition around Bears Ears National Monument presents new ways to think about tribal role in terms of management and co-management of the public land resource. Now, those opportunities and particularly questions or proposals raised by tribes have brought co-management to the forefront. And it seems that there's a lot of discussion about what co-management is, what it isn't, what it may be, and what the challenges or opportunities might be for that in particular. Perhaps is best evidenced by the 2016 secretarial order from former Secretary of the Interior, Sally Jewell, seeking to promote opportunities for cooperative and collaborative partnerships between federal agencies like the BLM and tribes, made sp a specific point that the order did not address co-management because in the view of that order, co-management was defined as a specific legal basis where that type of arrangement was required. A seemingly fairly narrow description or definition for co-management and instead promoting more collaborative or cooperative relationships. Now, the order went on to note a number of legal authorities that authorized agencies like the BLM to enter into cooperative and collaborative arrangements with tribes but at least for purposes of the order itself, those weren't considered co-management based on the definition provided by the order. And in addition, co-management has raised certain legal concerns about the delegation of federal authority or the sub-delegation from agencies to tribes of particular authorities, limits around the ability of agencies to delegate inherently federal functions and what those functions might be when it comes to co-management co co and management of the public land resource and certainly questions about whether or not the involvement of tribes in meaningful ways around the management of the public estate really aligns with and complies with mandates from Congress to public land agencies like the BLM. But importantly, I think all of this confusion and concern around co-management might be missing some of the important points and really some of the important work that many I'm sure on the call are already doing and that tribal leaders across the country are already engaged in. Because on the ground, really, co-management is a meaningful relationship pursuant to which there is a sharing of authority and an involvement of tribes and tribal perspectives and tribal priorities in the, in the actual management of the resource. And we can see opportunities for that 
exist within our current legal framework. There are certainly ways to think about expanding those going forward. But as Secretary Jewell mentioned this morning, and as has already been highlighted, agencies are already engaged in processes that might be improved or perhaps thought about it in a different way to bring about a more co-management appropriate framework. So rather than thinking about the details of what co-management is or isn't, I suggest maybe we, we might approach co-management from thinking about certain principles, about this historical and continuing connection that tribes have to public lands across the nation and how those historical connections and the knowledge that those generations upon generations connected to the land might bring could be used to the benefit of all of us in the management of our public resource. Importantly too, breaking down the separation between federal Indian law principles, particularly the trust relationship, the recognition of tribal sovereignty in the context of public land management is a principle that can help inform the actual management decisions that help that continue on the ground. And within the framework of existing co-management or cooperative or collaborative agreements, true sharing of authority to ensure that both parties have enforcement mechanisms and ways to negotiate and work out their differences around management decisions. I think those principles might help inform the way in which co-management can move forward in a collaborative and relationship building way. And there are current pathways in which those could be exercised right now without further legislation or additional work done. For example, in terms of public land planning processes that agencies engage in on a routine basis to set the path forward for management, providing meaningful opportunities for tribes to engage in those planning processes from an early stage and recognizing and incorporating tribal priorities around how lands will be managed, how the plan will reflect those tribal connections and tribal priorities going forward would help improve the ways in which those lands are managed from a tribal perspective and also have the benefit of bringing in traditional ecological knowledge on the part of tribes. In addition, as Secretary Holland mentioned, improving consultation processes and continuing to build relationships that really result in not a check the box exercise or simply window dressing to comply with procedural requirements, but a true fulfillment, both substantively and procedurally of the federal government's trust relationships to tribes can help <laughs> inform federal management decisions and more importantly, perhaps, build long-term the relationships with tribes and tribal leaders that aren't focused on project-specific determinations, but rather informed by those long-term relationships. And we can think in particular about the Section 106 process under the National Historic Preservation Act as an opportunity right now where those long-term relationships could really be built. And then finally, as I mentioned, the self-governance compacting options under the Indian Self-Determination and Educational Assistance Act have since 1992 been available to federal agencies outside the Bureau of Indian Affairs to provide compacts or work with tribes to compact for tribal assumptions of federal programs, functions, services, and activities. What we've seen, unfortunately, is very limited use of that authority. It's discretionary on the part of agencies outside the BIA. And for example, in fiscal year 21, there are only two such agreements with the BLM and tribes uh, across the country. That is an opportunity that exists right now for agencies to work with tribes to determine whether and have a pathway for empowering tribal activities. Even if it's minimal management activities or fire prevention, it provides a basis on which a true relationship can be built to better incorporate tribal perspectives and tribal knowledge in the management of our shared public resources. So despite the history and context and really the separation and, and long-term exclusion of tribes, there are inroads being made and there are there is significant progress. As I said, many of you on the call, I'm sure on your day-to-day -day work out in the field managing these public lands have built these meaningful relationships. Those can be bridges to a new era of improved tribal leadership around the management of public lands. And I think considering those within the principles of co-management, within the history and context of tribal sovereignty and the trust relationship, and ultimately with an eye toward the better management and the better fulfillment of public land mandates that agencies are already subject to, incorporating and meaningfully working with tribes to 
engage that generational knowledge and generational connections to the public estate can only serve to improve the public resource for all of us. And not only that, maybe offer some justice and some healing to those long time wounds of exclusion from the history that was discussed earlier. So with that, uh, hopefully have set the stage for further discussion by my esteemed panelists, and I look forward to engaging more. Thank you. There's a whole lot to unpack there, Professor Mills. <laughs> so hopefully we can start by um, turning the mic over to, I know a person that you studied under, um, Professor Wilkinson. Do you have anything to add to um, your favorite students uh, discussion here? <laughs> Um, that was a brilliant uh, presentation that Monty just made, and you won't get a better uh, summary of how public land management and tribal rights have evolved over the years and where we are now and what we have to do. And I, I really appreciate that. And um, I, I think that Secretary Holland and Laura uh, Davis, Daniel, um, uh, Dan Daniel Davis, excuse me, and Holly Doremus uh, did a, a really nice job on presenting uh, uh, the, the, the history of the BLM. And, um, and, and, and uh, so I just think so far, we, anyway, we've had uh, uh, just as good a start as we can get at, on, on this subject. Uh, for my part, um, um, I want to give congratulations to the BLM for its 75th anniversary. Um, I wasn't around in 1975, but I have uh, spent quite a lot of time over the past 50 years uh, with the BLM. Um, and uh, as Holly and, and Monty both emphasized the uh, uh, agency is definitely an improved agency over its early years, and it was it was kept down, and uh, uh, specific development interest uh, held sway, and um, and that was the early years, the real early years of the BLM. Um, I think of a key moment in the uh, history of this agency um, involves uh, Bruce Babbitt. And uh, in 1996, when Bruce uh, did the Interior Department workup for the proclamation that, that uh, 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 the president uh, was going to uh, adopt, um, Bruce um, uh, proposed that the BLM should um, be the managing agency for the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. Never been done before. All national monuments had, had been mostly with the Park Service and, and some with the uh, Forest Service. But this was the first time the BLM ever, ever uh, had that authority. And Bruce, to his everlasting credit, did that for two reasons. Uh, one is he believed that the BLM over the uh, past many years, couple of decades at that point, um, had become more uh, uh, focused on uh, conservation and sustainability. And he wanted to reward them he thought the BLM had deserved it and earned it. And, um, um, and secondly, he wanted to encourage them to do more. By, by, by doing that monument would encourage the BLM to uh, go out even further. And by the way, in that monument, uh, the tribes were really active. It, it wasn't like Bears Ears where the tribes petition, were the formal petitioners. But uh, back then, the, the, the Navajo, Hopi, and, and Pueblos uh, were really active uh, in, in, in getting that monument established. And 
Uh, so, uh, so since then, um, oh, I, I was going to say a, a specific thing, which has already been alluded to that came out of that, um, is the uh, BLM's National Conservation Land System, 30 million, 33 million acres, and uh, it really is in the conservation and wildness uh, arena, no question about it. Um, since uh, the Grand Staircase, uh, the tribes, and, and Monty really de dealt with this well, uh, the tribes really started coming forward with, with federal agencies. Um, and uh, they did some in this, in the, for sure, in the 70s and 80s, but by the 90s, the tribes were, were, were really active. And uh, tribes know that people in Washington aren't back there sitting around thinking of what they can do for tribes. The tribal policies that, that well, every one that Monty mentioned were brought to Congress by the tribes. And so now that, that's why we are here really is that the tribes have come to the BLM and the BLM has responded. And, uh, uh, and, and but, but it's also recent and over half of the 75 years uh, the, the, the tribes weren't that active because they weren't that active. But now in modern times, again, Monty alluded to this, tribes have really substantial governments. They really are sovereigns. Uh, most of the tribes uh, uh, that you hear about, 90% 90, 90 of all Indians, have governments of 300 employees or more. And that doesn't include economic uh, uh, adventures such as uh, gaming and, and, inter, uh, and, and, and some resource development. It's tribal employees. And so they are real sovereigns now. And uh, back then, uh, say in, in 1970, you had tribes, most tribes uh, had one, two or three or zero employees. And again, now they're up to really big numbers, substantial, often, often more, often larger and more influential than the nearby county governments. So, um, so, um, we have in the program uh, the objective or, or the, the context, and I want to read these words. The BLM has a legal, moral, and ethical obligation to ensure that tribal homeland sites are protected and that tribes have an affirmative role in shaping the management of public lands with this longstanding uh, connection. The panelists will discuss how the agency can truly live up to its tribal trust obligations and involve tribes as sovereign nations on an equal footing. And um, that's a new, new kind of language in effect. Um, um, but, but, but I believe, as, as has been suggested right from the secretary on down, that, that that kind of language is taken seriously by the BLM now. And it's an agency that's well equipped to uh, 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 do that. Of course, it isn't fully implemented yet. But it, and it's complicated. Boy, it's complicated. It, Monty explained how it's a, it's a combination of having policies from Washington, but also negotiations between individual tribes um, and and uh, the agencies uh, to develop uh, uh, collaborative management um, systems. Um, and. Uh, uh, so, so I, I believe uh, th that that the BLM is is in a good place now and and is open in a way that uh, is really inspiring. Um, I want to say a few words about Bears Ears. Um, 
And uh, because th that's what we have now, really, uh, le leading aside in the Northwest, where we have co collaborative management or co-management three ways, federal government, tribes, and the state over uh, fisheries resources and, uh, and, and other natural resources, some uh, public lands matters. But it is co-management. And uh, but but on the public lands, pure public, and the, the, so there are public lands out there. But but the, but uh, the 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 relationship uh, goes way beyond that. But for pure public land collaborative management, um, Bears Ears is the first that that we we have seen. And there are other projects going on. I understand that. But uh, but but uh, we have. That and 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 what um, uh, what I think and I and I want to say that in terms of the BLM, Neil Cornsey, uh, who was director uh, 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 during uh, the uh, Obama administration, uh, really came forward on Bears Ears, and he was a, an essential player in that, and so the BLM. Uh, deserves, I think, a lot of credit uh, for his work and, and, and the work of the BLM on Bears Ears because it, it uh, um, is mostly uh, BLM land, some Forest Service land. But um, what I think of the, 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 the proclamation, uh, Obama's proclamation, is, is really exceptional in a number of ways. And what I think of, of it is, and, and I don't mean to be uh, emotional or something about this, but I, I think that the Bears Ears uh, proclamation was a love song to the land, the tribes, and the relationship between the tribes and the land. And um, <clears throat> Uh, I'll just read one passage from it, which is is really profound natural resource policy, it, it just as good as it gets. And uh, President Obama uh, wrote this, the traditional ecological knowledge amassed by the Native Americans whose ancestors inhabited this region passed down from generation to generation offers critical insight into the historic and scientific significance of the area. Such traditional knowledge itself is a resource to be protected and used in understanding and, and managing this landscape sustainability for generations to come. Traditional knowledge is itself a resource to be protected and used in understanding and managing this uh, landscape sustainability for generations to come. Now, um, uh, those words, um, um, I, 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 ho I hope th th those thoughts, those concepts, those powerful uh, messages, um, I hope guide uh, what, what we're going to be doing from now. The, this administration, and as, as, as we know, uh, first, first Native Secretary ever, but also more Natives in the administration than ever before. And in the Interior Department, department uh, you have Native Americans represented throughout the agency. And there's a lot of good work going on about collaborative management. And so um, I'm gonna just briefly uh, mention collaborative management and traditional knowledge. I think th they are the basic concepts uh, that, 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 we, that, that we are aiming to put in place. And um, um, traditional knowledge, uh, what a powerful and fascinating notion it is. Um, it's not, in my mind, tr tr traditional uh, ecological knowledge. 
And uh, many Indian people have said, no, ecology is a Western science. And we, we favor ecology. We have ecology on our staffs, but it, it's, it's a Western notion. It, it's, it's traditional knowledge that comes fully from us. And um, um, I, I want to say that uh, uh, I, I'm, you know, doing some work on, but, but it's going to be the, the tribes, really, and, and, and the... And the agency officials often in the field that put uh, beef on, on those terms, traditional knowledge and, and collaborative management. And for example, um, the, the BLM uh, ought to appreciate um, and, and does that the tribes, all, all, all tribes really have mature and um, able uh, agencies and staff in natural resources and culture. The each individual tribe, so, so, so the BLM can be dealing with quality uh, uh, people, experienced people um, in, 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 in these negotiations over collaborative management and traditional knowledge. Uh, traditional knowledge um, is another way of knowing, another way of knowing. And the tribes um, know so much more than the majority of society does about, about the, the, the different resources out there, the medicines, uh, uh, the small animals, uh, the water. And, and, uh, and, and they know where, where those things are and, and also for cooking and and uh, 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 and, and clothing uh, out on the land and and that all goes into traditional knowledge and um, I, I just hope that that uh, 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 we can all come together realize how complicated this is uh, and um, because when the tribes come in with traditional knowledge about, let's just say, particular plants, um, they, 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 they may, for, for us to uh, uh, make real the language that, that, that we're talking about, um, there may, may have to be MOAs or, or regs. Or, uh, or other procedures to protect certain land, uh, 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 plants. And maybe the, there's been commercial exploitation of those plants. Maybe there have to be closures of, of areas to protect traditional plants outside of uh, 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 economic development, but also sometimes just general traffic. They're getting tr trampled down. And so it, it's not just talk. It, it, it's got to end up being particular things that, uh, uh, particular aspects of traditional knowledge and understanding what we have to do to make them real and be another way of knowing. Uh, and I and I think that um, I think that's going to there's going to be a lot of good work on this I think in the future and I think it's it's going to be very exciting and I think that includes visitors because uh, traditional knowledge can be presented in a number of ways to the public that, that people really are interested in whether it's songs or dances or or prayers or or or, 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 or just different practices so so I think. Um, I feel we're at a great time right now, and, and I think that the BLM really is wanting to go ahead, and um, and, and I and I think it's going to happen, and it's going to go slow, maybe, uh, but we, from both the federal uh, side, you've got responsibilities, and from the tribal side, you've got responsibilities. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Really appreciate that. Amen. Huh? I <laughs> think it's really a great uh, handoff to our tribal leader. Um, I saw you nodding, Chairman Lopez, when um, <laughs> when Professor Wilkinson was talking about the difference between traditional knowledge and ecological knowledge. I'm very interested to hear what you have to say about what tribes bring to the table relative to land management, and I'm very interested in your remarks. Um, you can take over the mic. Thank you. Well, good morning, and, and thank you for inviting me to speak here. It's an honor. Um, I want to first give thanks to the Bureau of Land Management, um, Conservation Lands Foundation, um, Parks, uh, the, the Parks Program at UC Berkeley, and others. Um, the speakers before me set this up beautifully, I can tell you that. Um, everything, you know, what they were talking about is exactly um, what I talk about every day. Um, I was elected chair in 2003, and in 2006, tribal elders came to a tribal council meeting, and they said our, our creation story tells us the creator gave us the responsibility to take care of Mother Earth and all living things. Mother Earth wasn't their term, but it's a term that's recognized today and, and is pretty effective for for, for understanding what we mean or what they meant. And so that um, that was kind of scary to us at first because because of our history, three periods of brutal colonization that lasted over a hundred years, where each period of the colonizers wanted to destroy our knowledge of our culture, our knowledge of our spirituality, our knowledge of our environment, and our indigenous knowledge that had been handed off for thousands and thousands of years. But we took that seriously and we talked about that at tribal council. And they said, we have to recognize that it's not our fault that we had lost that knowledge. You know, we really do have to recognize that it was not our fault, but that we have to also have a responsibility to restore that knowledge so that we can return to that path so that we can fulfill our obligation to creator and that we can honor our ancestors. And since, since that meeting, our tribe has worked hard every day to do that, to restore that indigenous knowledge. And we've learned a lot. We learned that our, that our ancestors were not hunters and gatherers. Uh, we, you know, that right there is a, a very um, uh, 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 indigenous and, 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 and way of, of of looking at our ancestors. They, they were just simply, you know, bouncing around hoping to find some food that they could eat that day to survive another day. Our people very actively managed the landscapes. And they learned a lot. They learned that first and foremost, that that, oblig that, that responsibility to take care of Mother Earth and all of these things was a moral authority and a moral obligation and, today, and, and since that time, only tribes have the moral authority to speak for the lands of their traditional tribal territory. And I did hear Professor Wilkinson talk, use that word moral, you know, responsibilities, obligations. And I'm very thankful that that was brought up in the conversation. So, you know, and, 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 and to fulfill that obligation to keep the lands uh, moral, we, we develop prayers and we develop ceremonies and, and we develop ways of, of showing respect and acknowledging that those plants have the same mother and father that we do. They, you know, the, 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 you know our, our, our father is Father Sky, the same as those plants, the same as the birds, the wildlife, etc. They have the same mother, Mother Earth. So those plants are our relatives. And the way you take care of your relatives is with love, with patience, with gentleness. You sing for you sing to them. You pray for them. You listen to them. Those are the relationships that we need to restore to, to, to our world. To our world. When we look at what's happening with you know all the laws that were passed and stuff like that, all they did 
was remove, remove spirituality from the land. And we need to restore that. In a couple of weeks, we're going to be hosting, we worked, um, part of it was with, with BLM. We worked, uh, we're working to have a dam removed. That dam is being removed this, this week. And it's a smaller dam, but it's spring fed. So that's going to be, allow us to restore salmon because that water will be cold enough for the salmon. And so we're holding a, a calling home the salmon ceremony, which was very traditional to our to our people in the past. We're going to restore the ceremony and we're going to restore salmon to that to 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 that creek. So you know, so that um, uh, uh, so that the salmon have a place to spawn. We also learned how to take care of the lands. All plants have an obligation. That obligation is to take care of the fungi, to take care of the insects, to take care of the birds, the four-legged, and people, and much more. Today, when you look at that monoculture and stuff like that, how long can that last? If it lasts to the end of our children's lifetime, I doubt it. A new, you know, we have to be, we have to return to the way that our ancestors took care of the plants. And those plants have to be, you know, have to know that they have a responsibility greater than just taking, uh, just providing for people. As we work through that path of how to relearn the knowledge of our ancestors, we learned that fire was a very important tool. Fire was a gift from creator. It's not something to be afraid of. It is a gift, and that was, and that gift right here was for the purpose of ceremony, for prayer. It's important for cooking, for heating, for providing light. But it's also a very important tool to manage the land, to manage the landscapes. Our people learned that they would, would burn, you know, they would take a look at a landscape and divide it into segments, five, seven, ten segments. And they would burn one segment each year. And whenever, um, and then after that, and after that first segment burned, you would get a great production of seed plant, of excuse me, of, of seed growth. And that was important to take care of the birds and other seed eating animals. That sec after the second year after the fire, you get these shoots coming up. And they're soft and moist and juicy. And those are the preferred foods for the grazing animals, the elk, the, the, the deer, the antelope, etc. The third year of growth, you start getting more bushier plants. And those have their specific purpose on, on and on. These materials provided materials for basketry. They were our food plants, mm -hmm. our medicine. Mm -hmm. We had over 100 medicine plants. We had over 70 uh, plants identified that were very specific for our food. They're practically all gone now, if, if you know, and a lot of them have, are gone. So we're working hard to restore those. We're also, you know, in the, in, in the subsequent years, they provide materials for housing, for clothing, for tools, etc. That's what our people learn. And so today we're working to restore those fires. We don't call them prescribed fires. Those are cultural fires. They're, 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 they were meant to provide and, and, and protect and, and enhance uh, the, the, the cultural resources for, for all wildlife, uh, for ourselves. We learned how to take care of the waters and the ocean. Today, we're working to restore, uh, to, you know, to go back and, and work on, on, on stewarding and managing the oceans. We take care of the, 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 the kelp, the, seaweed, the, the weeds, the, the sea grasses, the, the shellfish, the sea mammal, um, the, the small fishes, which are very important. The um, salmon, the, excuse me, the, the, the sardines, the anchovies, etc. the small fishes, whenever those salmon come in from the ocean, they don't just head upstream, they have to transition from salt water to fresh water. And so that habitat at, along the ocean, along the coastline is very important for them to have the food resources they need to get their body weight on, to get their strength back, so they can make that very hard migration up the river. Now, I want to talk about our, there is a lot more that we work on, but because of time, I won't be able to go into it now. Our relationship with BLM. 
We work primarily at the Chotoni Coast Dairies National Monument. And we started working with, and that's a newly designated monument. And part of the, Cal, the California National Monument, Coastal Monument or something like that. I don't remember the exact name. They were going to call it the, 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 coastal, the Coast Dairies National Monument. But we wanted our ancestors who lived there at that land to be remembered. And we asked that the, 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 the Chotoni tribe be in that name. And so today that's a Chotoni Coast Dairies National Monument. So there, and there's no survivors in the Chotoni tribe. We have the responsibility to ensure that those uh, that, that, that the Chichoni tribe is never forgotten. And by having the uh, um, national monument named after it is very important and, and such. But we have also been working very closely with the Bureau of Land Management there. And we have a great relationship. We have an MOU that we sign with them. And that MOU, or MOA, I don't even know which, uh, gives us access for ceremony. We're gathering, gathering of people, gathering of cultural resources. It gives us access for research, gives us access uh, for um, education, education from tribal members and education for the public. It gives us access for, uh, for stewardship. One of the first things we ask for is that we do a survey um, of of the of the lands, primarily along the the riparian areas of the rivers. Uh, that's normally where our people lived. And what it was is to look for cultural, uh, to identify cultural resource early, right? You know, one of the very first things, identify the cultural resources that were there. Um, well, we during that survey we identified four, perhaps five new archaeological sites. They were never reported, so we were able to get them on the National Register. We also, but we also, when we did the survey, we also looked for the, the biological and, 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 and the other things such as, um, and the other features and stuff like that that are important. Springs, uh, caves, um, view, um, uh, views, uh, view sheds, etc. Those are, there are, are all important cultural resources to tribes. After that, we wrote a report and we met with the BLM and we shared that with them. And as I said, we did that early. So whenever they started developing the plan to open that, um, that, those lands to the public, when they started to say, where do we put the trails? Where do we put parking, et cetera? They could avoid impacting um, um, the, 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 important, the, the cultural resources of, of the Chotoni tribe. And they were very cooperative very cooperative and when that plan came out we couldn't be more happy with it to be honest with you now we're revising the um the the moa and we're working to uh get fire in you know we had fire before but we're we folk, uh, uh, revising the the um moa to talk more a little bit more um uh, um, um directly about fire we're always talk always talking about removing a lot of the invasive. Uh, we recently worked out there, a couple of weeks back, we worked out there to remove a lot of invasives and to do cleanup where there's a lot of homeless camps that have been abandoned and stuff like that. We also went out to remove a lot of the invasive plants that were just choking out trees right along the, right along the, the river there and such like that. And we worked side by side with the BLM. We, work every, we started every day with prayer and we talked about how to have reciprocal relationships of, of offering tobacco throughout the day for things that you remove. And we offered that to the BLM staff and such like that. And they joined us in the prayers and they joined us in our protocols. They partook in that. And I think it was so important. We're also working to remove, There's a, we have a lot of eucalyptus trees up there. And eucalyptus trees are, 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 are not um, indigenous to California. And... Um, they, 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 they hurt the habitat in great ways. So, you know, we're talking about how can we remove the eucalyptus tree? So these are the things that we're negotiating about. But we're very comfortable and very happy with our relationship with the BLM. And we look forward to that continuing. And they have other BLM 
um, lands in our territory. And, and we will, um, once we build capacity, um, we will start talking to the uh, super, um, the, the, the superintendents or, or managers or directors of those districts. Um, um, finally, I want to talk about the word healing. It's, you know, when we talk about healing, a lot of people think that the indigenous people need to heal from that horrendous, horrendous history that they experienced. That the indigenous people, you know, today they suffer um, extreme uh, high cases of suicide, and alcohol or, or addictions, of depression and on and on. And all that is true. But what's really important to know, and um, we talk about this all the time in our tribe, is the perpetrators need to heal. The perpetrators who were responsible for causing that destruction to the tribes must heal. And in all honesty, the perpetrators need to heal more than the tribes do. And how could we ever have a healthy relationship if if we cannot have a, a relationship that's built on trust, that we can't have a healthy relationship with a partner that's healthy and that is not carrying that baggage and that from that historic trauma that they brought upon the other people and the, and the soul wound that they caused to themselves because of that um, horrific history. We need to heal together. Perpetrators and, and, and tribal people need to heal together so that we can, if we're ever going to form a healthy relationship. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. And, and it was truly an honor to speak to this panel and the, and the amazing um, panelists that are here. Thank you. That was fantastic. Thank you so much for your powerful words. Really appreciate your time and, and your partnership. Thank you. Um, we're going to now turn to um, um, Mr. Martinez, who has a very interesting background um, in both uh, federal and tribal management. Uh, why don't you round us out, uh, Mr. Martinez, and then I'll ask hard questions. All right, Ta'a, I'm Tunka. Tribal Chairman Lopez, Professor Wilkinson, about Professor Mills, about um, Abogadu uh, Jackson, when I talk to my you, my auntie, about I'm kind of Deb Holland about um, PLM uh, to my auntie, and um, thank you, and it's an honor to be here uh, among all of you and uh, have this opportunity to uh, talk about the Bureau of Land Management. I uh, just thank all of uh, the participants that uh, are here and our uh, honorable chairman, Mr. Lopez, for being part of this panel. Um, it's, uh, I enjoyed listening to all the opening remarks and statements that everyone did, uh, everyone spoke about. Um, as uh, uh, I'm coming to you from the uh, my homeland here in Taos Pueblo, home of the Red Willow people, also the, the homeland of the Picarese people, the Huilatuus, who live just south of here uh, in uh, the Taos area. The Taos area um, had many tribes coming into our area from the plains, the Arapahoes, Cheyenne, Kiowa, uh, the Navajos from the, from the west, uh, the, uh, the Utes also from the west, and the Hickory Apaches. So I'm uh, quite familiar with all of our tribes in this area. And uh, as a uh, uh, person that uh, has had some extensive experience uh, managing land, um, Taos Pueblo has, uh, is one of the compact tribes uh, under the Bureau of Indian Affairs. We compact uh, uh, our, uh, all of our natural resource programs here. And uh, I was fortunate enough to, uh, mm, how should I say this? Um, Marm was twisted to come back and work for my tribe after I had, uh, uh, you know, completed my career, kind of completed my career at the Bureau of Indian Affairs and having worked on the corporate side for the Pueblo of Pewaukee, just north of Santa Fe there. Um, 
quite interesting uh, working on uh, in the corporate side uh, where a tribe is looking at uh, uh, not a subsistence economy, but uh, more of a, uh, a market-based uh, uh, economy for uh, the betterment of their people with their businesses that they've developed there. And uh, But now I'm uh, back in my traditional uh, homeland uh, looking at uh, how I can better the, uh, uh, the lands that we have. Um, I don't know if any of you know, but uh, Taos Pueblo fought for 60 some years for our, our Blue Lake Wilderness, our um, um, area that um, our ancestors um, have always been. An, uh, uh, one of our creation stories is the Blue Lake uh, uh, area as well as the uh, Mesa Verde area. So from uh, the Four Corners all the way to uh, uh, Taos, New Mexico, uh, all along this area is our our route and our, uh, our, our homeland, so to speak, which cover Forest Service and Bureau of Land Management uh, lands right now. Um, as uh, a uh, director for Natural Resources for Taos Pueblo, um, uh, working under the uh, uh, auspices and in cooperation with the uh, Taos Pueblo War Chief's Office to manage our natural resources. Um, uh, we have uh, developed uh, uh, very good relationships with the Bureau of Land Management here and the U.S. Forest Service, uh, which uh, continues to manage our, our ancestral land as well as the BLM. Uh, as you as you go east of Taos and east of the Rio Grande Gorge, and north, uh, a lot of BLM land uh, out there as well. Uh, the uh, uh, my mind is moving real quickly, but I want to say that um, uh, growing up, uh, we were still a very traditional uh, uh, nation here at Taos Pueblo, uh, still rooted deeply in our traditional cultural ways, our language and our, um, our uh, uh, traditional e uh, ecological knowledge of the area, whether we're going from uh, Taos Pueblo, high up here at uh, our village sits at 7,000 feet toward the east, uh, eastern plains where we used to hunt buffalo, or um, going up higher, up into the higher elevations, uh, uh, over 13,000 feet. Um, we, we, we have a lot of extensive knowledge that um, uh, we talk about in our language. Uh, we know uh, all, all of the places from, uh, from our point of view, our world that starts here at Taos and goes uh, all the way to the tribes uh, down in uh, south of Albuquerque, toward Hopi, uh, toward the, <clears throat> this, with all 360 degrees uh, out of uh, Taos Pueblo, we, we have names and uh, so our traditional ecological knowledge uh, of, of our area and our, um, our uh, uh, of what we know uh, is still uh, heavily embedded in us and uh, it's part of our everyday culture. Uh, one of the things that um, I, I just want to explain real quick before um, I, I move on is that um, Growing up, uh, as we as our tribe fought for the return of our Blue Lake, um, uh, we're not the only one that got this back. But the Klamath people, want to I want to mention them. The Klamath up there in the Northwest were also one of the tribes that got some land back uh, in the early years. Uh, and uh, that uh, uh, growing up, uh, I, I would sit around my grandparents' table listening to um, the uh, litigation that was going on. Um, that our tribe had with the United States. And uh, as soon as um, I uh, realized at the age of 10 that, you know, I'm going to be a uh, natural resource manager of some sort, that's what I put my uh, efforts to um, so that I could assist, excuse me, my tribe with um, uh, managing their lands and um, someday come back to work for them and here I am. Um, so that uh, allowed me to uh, 
get my degree at Colorado State there, uh, Dr. Wilkinson. I was a neighbor of yours. Uh, I had a few friends over there at CU. And um, so uh, once leaving, uh, once getting back into the Bureau of Indian Affairs, I, uh, I, I worked uh, with all 23 tribes here in New Mexico, um, the Utes, uh, Southern Ute, Ute Mountain, the Hickoria, and uh, um, spent a lot of time uh, uh, down on the Mescalero Apache Reservation. My, uh, my father, my late father went to um, uh, the boarding school with, uh, uh, I don't know if any of you know, the late uh, Wendell Chino, president of the Mescalero Apache tribe. And um, I, I ended up there as a, a young forester. And uh, being the only Native American forester, I want to tell you that having that um, um, traditional ecological knowledge, my uh, Western uh, forestry and natural resources uh, education that I got at Colorado State. Um, we were just gearing up there at, on the Mescalero Apache uh, Nation uh, to uh, through the through the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs to uh, um, increase their timber management uh, and uh, their annual allowable cut there on the. Mescalero Apache Reservation at the time was 20 million board feet, quite a quite a large number uh, to uh, look at harvesting in the southern New Mexico. And you, and if you ever ever went from uh, Taos down to uh, uh, Mescalero, you'd know that you go through some high desert country and you go, man, it's too hot down here. What what grows down here? Till you hit the Sacramento Mountains of the Mescalero Apache, and man, you got ponderosa pine, Douglas fir, aspen, and that uh, quite a uh, uh, annual uh, rainfall that uh, contributed to the the magnificent forest down there. So uh, coming coming down there, um, uh, let me just back up a little. When I was growing up, my parents and family would go down to the Mescalero because of their friendship with uh, the late Wendell Chino. And I said, no, nah, I'm not going. I, I don't want to go there. It's too hot. I'm going to stay here in Taos where it's nice and cool. And so uh, they all went down there and enjoyed their, their time there at, uh, one, at the, their annual feast during the 4th of July. And uh, lo and behold, I, I end up down there. I worked down there for seven years. And um, one of the things that, uh, that I brought to the Mescalero Apaches was, um, uh, like I said, my traditional ecological knowledge, my knowledge that I learned uh, observing things in the forest, uh, out on the rangelands, um, along the riparian areas. And so at the time, uh, the traditional forestry, forestry practices that were taking place were uh, called even age management practices. Uh, quite, uh, the Forest Service was doing that, the BLM was doing that up in the north, Northwest. Uh, I mean, you could, anywhere you go, that was the, that was the thing that was the uh, forest management practice was looking at uh, species-specific management. And um, I got there to Mescalero and um, just talking with the uh, with the people there, the people I worked with, forestry technicians, uh, really they were just forestry technicians. There weren't, they didn't have any uh, uh, foresters uh, that were native. I was the only one. And uh, um, the, uh, uh, the discussions I had with uh, a wildlife biologist that was uh, that followed me from uh, Albuquerque down to Mescalero. He was uh, he, he was a native as well, uh, and um, I don't know if you guys know Butch Blazer. He was the Under Secretary of Agriculture under Obama. Well, Butch Blazer uh, was the Natural Resource Manager at Mescalero at the time, and. Um, between Butch Blazer and and uh, the biologist that wildlife biologist that followed me down there, uh, Norman Hohola from Isleta Pueblo, uh, we uh, knowing what we knew uh, and discussing with the tribe uh, what their goals and objectives were for maintaining their forest for the traditional aspects of uh, of their life of their culture. Um, <clears throat> We changed the whole management structure to look at 
uneven age management as part of the uh, process to um, help the tribe with their economic uh, ability to harvest 20 million board feet a year. Um, and through uneven age management, we looked at not just one, one age class of trees, but we looked at all age classes of trees in the forest. We looked at all species of trees in the forest. We looked at their, um, their cattle, cattle operations that they had there, their big game hunting operations that they had there on, on, the, uh, on their reservation. And um, we included uh, fire. Uh, we, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Chairman Lopez, you talked about uh, prescribed burn, but actually there were cultural burns um, that included uh, their uh, traditional plants and uh, uh, all the uh, uh, plants that they, they utilized uh, for, uh, for their cultural um, traditions. Uh, and and their, their land went from uh, um, Mesquite uh, Desert all the way up to uh, Sierra Blanca Peak at over 12,000 feet. So uh, with that, uh, we had um, uh, cooperative uh, relationships, collaborative uh, relationships with the U.S. Forest Service down there. Uh, and the uh, BLM on the eastern side, on the uh, drier side of the uh, reservation, uh, where we would look at, uh, 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 with the BLM, uh, prescribed natural fire when we had uh, lightning strikes on the east side. And, um, uh, and of course, uh, uh, one of the things that I, I like to mention is the, uh, how we dealt with uh, endangered species uh, with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, at the time when I was down there, the Mexican spotted owl was uh, the uh, uh, species that was shutting down a lot of the forest practices in, in the area. As it, and um, through the collaboration of tribes, uh, and that was mentioned by you, uh, Professor Mills, uh, with each other and, and their capacities to, uh, uh, to build um, on their uh, staffing, that uh, through all of us, uh, all of us uh, native professionals, I, sh I just want to say that, um, uh, we worked with um, the uh, tribes in New Mexico, the tribes in uh, Arizona uh, to develop our own uh, guidance and, and uh, for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, as we dealt with the Mexican spotted owl, we didn't want the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service telling our tribes that we were working with how to deal with the uh, Mexican spotted owl. So um, through the, our efforts with uh, uh, all of the big timber tribes in the Arizona, New Mexico, Southern Colorado, um, we developed guidelines that we utilized and went to court with uh, U U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. One of the things we did on the Mescalero because we were uh, we had these uh, 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 timber sale uh, 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 projects that we we're getting into, we had uh, uh, we did extensive uh, analysis with the approval of the tribe for the Mexican spot owl because uh, on most tribal um, traditional uh, tribal cultures. The owl may or may not be a, a good uh, uh, animal. <laughs> so, um, you know, we had to get approval from, from those folks, those traditional cultural people that we can do that on their lands. And we explained to them uh, the uh, process we were going to look at in order for us to achieve uh, our own, uh, in order for us to achieve uh, and maintain the tribe's sovereignty uh, uh, over uh, the um, the land and the animals that uh, the tribe uh, uh, understood and that we understood for them, working for them. And so uh, tribes definitely want to maintain their sovereignty over these kinds of uh, management uh, issues and concerns. 
And so through that, we developed a, a lot of information on the spotted owl, uh, which um, gained us the uh, approval <laughs> uh, with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, they understood where we were coming from, where the tribe was coming from, how our traditional ecological knowledge uh, contributed to the um, um, uh, to the uh, Endangered Species Act and allowing us to manage uh, those kinds of species uh, for the tribe. And it was quite, a, 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 I think, a landmark uh, decision. Uh, and it just cleared the way. We, we had no more obstacles for that issue as we uh, dealt with uh, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, presently, as here at Taos Pueblo, uh, the, uh, oh, well, let, me, let me just go back uh, one more time. I was, uh, went to a conference with the Native American Fish and Wildlife Society down in, on the Mescalero and uh, uh, Butch Blazer and Norman Hohol and myself were in this uh, 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 session where there, uh, where there was a, uh, uh, the Fort Collins station of the, uh, uh, I, I can't remember what the Fort Collins station is called. The, uh, it's, yeah, the Forest Services, uh, USDA, uh, Fort Collins uh, technical station up there. Anyway, uh, one of the young ladies was doing a, uh, uh, a thing on the spotted owl, and she was, uh, she was talking about everything we did uh, down there on the Mescalero, and I was telling Norman Butch, I go, we should have wrote a book on this. <laughs> but it was quite amazing that she picked up on all of the things that we did. Afterwards, we we talked to her and, and um, directed her to all the files that we had there at the Mescalero Agency for the Mexican Spotted Owl. But, um, you know, um, one of the things that, um, oh, uh, I, and I want to finish this up with Mescalero, one of the things that, um, that I, I want to let you guys know is that, um, um, through, uh, you know, tribes through their own sovereignty have the right to uh, to sue the federal government. And they sued the Bureau of Indian Affairs down there in Mescalero uh, over, uh, um, they felt that maybe some of the uh, timber management practices weren't uh, going along as they expected. And um, uh, it, it was just because things were happening quite uh, uh, in, quite rapidly. And so um, I happened into the uh, uh, tribal chairman's office one morning and uh, lo and behold, I see my professors, uh, my forest economics professor from Colorado State uh, uh, and uh, my civil cultural professor from there and uh, our my uh, uh, fire uh, professor from there. I go, oh, hey, what are you guys doing here? And they go, oh, we're, uh, we're expert uh, witnesses for the tribe. Oh, you are? And they go, yeah, we're we're going to court on some of the things that are happening down here. I go, yeah. And then here comes the uh, uh, Mr. Chino and his vice president. Uh, they came out and they saw me and they go, hey, Cameron, you want to go along? We're going to go look at different things. I go, yeah, I'll go with you guys. So we hopped in the vehicle and went uh, driving around the reservation. I was talking about uh, uh, the timber program. I talked about the reforestation program because of the fires down in that part of the state. Well, there's quite a uh, we get quite a, a few fires down there in the springtime, and they uh, eventually turn large. So we have we had quite a bit. Uh, we had a large scale um, reforestation program going on down there. Uh, we had a large fire uh, uh, cultural fire program down there as well. Uh, so. Through our, my conversations with them and explaining the operations for reforestation, uh, um, the fire program as well, and what we do there with uh, with that with that program, um, uh, they uh, they were uh, they had excluded the fire and reforestation program from from the lawsuit, but they did. Uh, 
uh, take the BIA to court on timber management. Uh, and it was primarily because the, uh, uh, the uh, figures that they were working with, uh, and that wasn't in my program, I like to say, uh, uh, but it was in a program that uh, uh, they felt that uh, um, the 20 million board feet uh, wasn't a figure that uh, the tribe could live with that could sustain their their um, uh, sawmill operations. So um, I ended up in court talking about uh, the reforestation program. Um, in, I ended up in federal court talking about the reforestation program, and I was on the stand for about four hours and uh, explained everything we do in reforestation uh, and uh, some of the uh, formulas that we develop there, uh, uh, the conditions, site conditions of the stands that we're looking at. And uh, so, um, um, as I got off the stand, I just want to say that um, our um, the tribal chairman was there, the vice chairman, and the uh, expert uh, witnesses from Colorado State, and uh, they just said you get you did a good job, uh, which is was amazing at the time, uh, just uh, to know that we uh, we had accomplished uh, what I set out to do in order to um, provide good service to uh, to another tribal nation. But um, the, the the tribe did end up winning the, the lawsuit uh, on the timber uh, harvesting side of the of the lawsuit and uh, put aside everything else. But, um, you know, with with the with that knowledge, with the uh, uh, understanding from from the tribe of what they want um, um, it it just makes it a lot easier for them to uh, uh, know that the decisions they're making and the decisions they're making for their people uh, for the future are uh, are uh, looked at by folks that they trust that you know that have the understanding of where their where where their traditions are are uh, are from where they've uh, arrived from and the future that they're looking at because that's that was something that was um, uh, in a lot of our discussions as I worked there on the Muscular Apache listening to uh, the people that I worked with that were older than me uh, that grew up uh, uh, you know in living in their forest, uh, uh, deriving their subsistence from the forest. Uh, it just helped to have somebody there that had that, that knew what they were talking about, that brought the traditional ecological knowledge that they, they understood that their, their language spoke about, their Apache language spoke about. And um, I was just honored to, to be there to help them achieve those goals that um, they knew their land was going to be well managed into the future. Right now, the Mescalero Apache is uh, has uh, compacted uh, their uh, forestry and natural resources program as well, and they're doing a great job. One of the foresters that was working with me, uh, Thora Walsh, is now um, uh, the natural resources director there, and uh, she is doing a great job there uh, collaborating with the U.S. Forest Service. Uh, the Forest Service uh, just is amazed uh, uh, on what we what we accomplished on the Mescalero Apache uh, reservation lands. Um, they're always come. They they make frequent trips to the Mescalero to look at at uh, uh, the management practices there uh, that we do in in fire, in reforestation, and in um, uh, timber management. And it's just a, a testament to knowing um, uh, what the what the tribe wants and where they're going. Um, they they not only utilize uh, their own reservation uh, for uh, their various traditional needs, but also the 
the national forest to their south and north and the BLMs toward the, the, the east. And, um, and as you, uh, they talk about other areas down toward the White Sands National Monument as well, because, um, you know, that, that was all their land. That was all their traditional lands where they uh, gathered their different um, uh, items that they need for their cultural ways and their traditional beliefs. So um, with that, I'm going to change my focus to uh, Taos Pueblo. One of the things that, uh, one of the, the uh, policy things that uh, has come out that we work with here is the uh, Tribal Forest Protection Act. I don't know if any of you have heard of that. Uh, it um, instructs both the Department of Ag and the Department of Interior to work with tribes um, on culturally significant areas along our borders. And um, I know the Carson National Forest here at, in the Taos area, uh, we brought that to their attention um, since 2017. Uh, the, the act has been out since 2014, I think. And um, so in 2017, we, um, uh, our Blue Lake Wilderness borders the, uh, uh, borders the uh, uh, Wheeler Peak Wilderness to the, uh, on, of the Carson National Forest and the Taos Ski Valley. And the Taos Ski Valley is, uh, there's some land in there that is privately owned by the Taos Ski Valley Incorporated. And uh, the Taos Ski Valley has a uh, special use permit with uh, the Carson National Forest. Uh, so, uh, which includes the village of Taos Ski Valley. So those, the, the Taos Ski Valley Incorporated, Taos, the village of Taos Ski Valley, have been developing uh, that area, the Ski Valley, for uh, a number of years now, and so we're looking at a a new um, uh, uh, management or, or uh, a ten-year uh, uh, development uh, plan that the Taos Ski Valley is uh, is implementing, and uh, through the Tribal Forest Protection Act, um, we have utilized that uh, with the Forest Service to uh, uh, collaborate on uh, reviewing that uh, development plan for the Taos Key Valley Incorporated and to review the um, extensive business development that has been going on in the village of Taos Key Valley. Uh, those areas, uh, we contend at that high elevation area associated to our um, our sacred areas up there uh, at around 13,000 feet, they're all connected. The water, the, the high elevation lakes that are there, the water that they utilize for making snow, uh, the water that they're going to be utilizing for uh, uh, their businesses in the village of Tuskegee Valley. Um, uh, we we uh, we just feel that that area is just uh, impacting uh, our boundary uh, significantly, in that we uh, have seen an increase in trespass onto tribal land. Um, so through that Tribal Forest Protection Act, through uh, our MOA, the Memorandum of, of Agreement with the Carson National Forest, uh, we developed. Um, uh, those uh, uh, documents so that uh, we're, we're an integral part of how we co-manage that area. I mean, it's just, um, uh, uh, we've, we've gone up to uh, this, uh, we've, uh, we've met real heavily now, I, I would say since 2017 to now with the Carson National Forest, the uh, Taos Key Valley Incorporated, uh, to make sure that um, they know exactly where we're coming from, the high concerns we have of that area, because the the development plan for the Towski Valley is looking at over 300,000 visitors a year just in that one uh, spot there on the Carson National Forest. And um, uh, as 
as the the tribe uh, tribal government and my staff have gone up there we have uh, uh, spoke to uh, both of those uh, uh, entities uh, on the significance of those high mountain peaks the high uh, high mountain lakes and streams and springs that are are all up there well we all have names for them like I, I was just telling you earlier um, uh, so uh, once you're on top of those peaks you can see into Colorado you can see all the way to those peaks that are uh, east of Santa Fe New Mexico you can see uh, west uh, toward the toward the Hickorya you can see southern Colorado and you can see the plains of, of the east so um, as the as they developed uh, their um, uh, the, the ski valley one of the peaks uh, up there had uh, had shrines from uh, from uh, Asia you know people from all over the world come to uh, New Mexico as well as the other states that you're familiar with I'm sure in Montana or uh, California and uh, on those peaks there uh, to us as as indigenous people they're quite significant to us because we're at the top of the world so um, as as we were up there we had flags there um, from, uh, from Asia like I mentioned uh, Tibetan flags and uh, the Forest Service was telling us that um, the uh, you know they, they they left them up there and our thinking our traditional thinking and our traditional knowledge of of our uh, of prayer of those kinds of things it's leave no trace <laughs> we leave no trace for our praying we leave no trace when we're visiting those those areas whether it's uh you know out there on the sagebrush flats on blm land or in the forest uh uh it's it's that way for a lot of uh, a lot of uh indigenous people and um especially in north america maybe south america as well uh you know uh, we we respect uh we respect that other other nations other indigenous nations have their ways of of prayer uh and that type of thing but for us uh in our area in our traditional cultural area uh it's leave no trace and uh um, you, you talk to any any number of our Pueblo tribes, our Apache tribes, uh, even the youth, they'll, they'll uh, tell you the same thing. Um, so with that, uh, we've had uh, good cooperation with them, um, with the Forest Service. Um, presently, um, the Taos Pueblo does uh, um, receive uh, numerous uh, section 106 um, letters on various um, uh, projects that are going on from the four corners to to the uh, Taos district of the BLM and um, my staff and I we comment on all of them uh, making sure that the BLM uh, uh, knows that uh, we are uh, engaged in, in our, our uh, traditional lands uh, we uh, this valley that we're in and the areas that are of concern um, while uh, while we were um, while the Taos Pueblo tribe was uh, initiating its um, litigation for the Blue Lake uh, land that uh, they got back um, we had uh, given the United States government a um, a map of our land area, <laughs> quite an extensive map, just like all the other tribes have done, and um, so with that we we continue to uh, want to uh, make sure that they know uh, we're present in in this state of New Mexico, uh, and uh, that um, the land that is was once that what that we once occupied is still a uh, part of our uh, our uh, culture and that uh, anything that happens 
uh, or is projected to happen, we want to have a say in how it's managed. Um, Mr. Martinez, I appreciate um, yeah. that. I do have to actually end this session, though. No problem. I, do, no problem. I do hope this is the beginning of a, a long and fruitful conversation. I want to thank all the panelists. Um, I'll have to save all my great questions for some other time. I am yeah. interested in your um, all of your opinions on durable things we can be doing to make um, an impact during this administration. Um, really appreciate everybody. And we will be taking a five minute break before we start the next panel. And with that, again, um, all my thanks to all of you for taking time out of your day to um, help us learn more about good examples and more that we can be doing to have better partnerships in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.